Southern California, as far as water goes, I mean, it's critical. I mean, when we even living in California, but you look at the, the pressures, the demands, the consumption use, you know, domestic needs versus agriculture, what have you. Uh, it's it's serious. And uh, but I think that's in terms of the unity and learning from each other. I thought, well, we'll throw together a program. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I always believe there's good, bad, and ugly in everything. I want to hear the good, I want to hear the bad, and I said, we all got little ugly things that are something that we wish we not had done. But for whatever reason, they had to do, they had to have to get the deal done. I know John with the Narfanum, they've been very active in this area with some of the tribes that have worked through settlements, and John has been very active uh, pretty much west-wide in terms of the Western Water Council, I believe it is. And when you go online and you look at all the water organizations at the county level, the state level, you know, they're, they've got that turf staked out. We don't. You know, I think the only thing we really read about is, oh, there's a conflict over there, so maybe a settlement in Navajo has been a good example. But they have, you know, they, uh, they blew off the Arizona delegation, Senator McCain and, and Kyle, on a, on a, uh, a settlement that was uh, in play, and tribes said, no, we don't want it. fighting with the state and the, 
to uh, have uh, both uh, uh, Levon and Bo uh, Mazzetti, Levon Peck, kind of share two chairmen from uh, La Jolla and Recon, uh, their perspectives on what they're experiencing. And you saw the, the little video program that they condensed down to the 23 minutes or whatever yesterday to give, give you some sense about the pushback and concerns and having to deal with people in San Diego County uh, to have a settlement in place or an act in 1988, can't get it implemented. 26 years later, it just makes no sense. You know, and, uh, and I, it's, it's, it's their business, and I'm certainly not uh, impinging on it in any way, but it, it's, it's, sad, it's sad to watch. But uh, having said that, uh, if Bo and, and uh, Levon, you want to come up, if you want to be then share it. <coughs> I know there's some tribes in, in the room, I know Muckleshoot has had to deal with their water issues. Uh, you know, the Plains area is altogether different. They just have, they have water imported, pipe of water, water pipelines and everything. They just can't get the water. When you look at that part of the country, the Missouri River, wherever there's a dam with a reservation uh, from North Dakota, well, that, that uh, system is so big as well. And, about three times, carries about three times the amount of water that the Colorado does. It used to be that the Colorado was carrying about 13 million acre feet a year. You moved to the Missouri, it's about 33 million acre feet a year. You moved to the Columbia, about 140 million acre feet a year. So different issues, but the, even the Missouri you had to deal with commerce because you had all the barges and the river boats and everything else, which Colorado doesn't have. And then certainly with uh, the Northwest and Columbia, I mean, it's, it's, you know, concerns about fish and timber and what have you, and, uh, it's very big. Go. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's good to see some of the old friends around. I, I think that uh, one of the things that's interesting is uh, thinking back to some of the older folks that are, that are here that I, I kind of grew up with is uh, where the hell did we go? Billy Frank said that this morning. That's true. Um, and I was thinking, you know, we all, lately, I think December 13th, the, the, commi the commission report came out on the trust responsibility and the administration. Uh, that's quite a document. Uh, it's spot on, particularly on page, I think it's 26. They reference the San Luis Rey case as a prime example of trust responsibility. Uh, I think it's clear, and I can say without any doubt or hesitation, uh, you don't have a trustee. You don't have one. You have one that's supposed to be there. In our case, which started in 1968 with the tribes, which is Paula tribe, San Pasqual, Alma, Rincon, Paula. Started in 1968. Went to the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, our case was one of the, or our, our the San Luis Rey case was one of the cases that helped start NARF. John will, I think, attest to, because it started out with a little group called the California Indian Legal Services. That's the first time we had legal help, and it was too big, and it's a national issue. So, Bob uh, Helsinger, Robert Getson, and <coughs> The Oklahoma family, yeah, because there were several of you guys involved. That was the foundation, I guess, for NARC, for one of the cases. Went to the Supreme Court in 1976, I believe it was. The Supreme Court said basically, go back, try to work something out. So in 1988, a bill was put together uh, that basically brought all the parties together. What the case was about is we have a river, the San Jose River. The federal government entered into three agreements right after the tribes were established, giving the water away. In other words, we had the water for our use from the river, then they gave it away to the city of Escondido and Best Irrigation District. So that was the basis of, of, of the dispute. Now, when we first filed suit, which was actually filed in 1969, the federal government was on our side all the way. They were acting like trustees. They were with us. Uh, then, in 2000, 
2004, our biggest obstacle is our trustee. Because our case, we've worked it out with our disputing parties. In other words, we sued the city of Escondido and Best Irrigation District, the five BAMs. We're all on the same page. We've reached agreement. Settlement Act was passed in 1988. Money was appropriated. The 16,000 acre feet of supplemental water was to be found or provided by the federal government. But we didn't know it took 20 years to find that water, which happened to be from the Colorado River. The two canals that brought that water into the state of California were lined with concrete. They were dirt prior to that period. So by lining those two canals, we found basically 100,000 acre feet of water that was leaching out before. So out of that, the Secretary of Battle was the key in this process. The first 17% of the water, which equaled our 16,000 acre feet, was set aside for the San Luis Rey Water Authority and the parties involved in the lawsuit. So we had the water, we had the money. Well, let's we'll sign it. Now our trustee is starting in 2004. Wait a minute. Uh, you got to quantify your water rights. If we're going to give you 16,000 acre feet of supplemental water, we're taking away your reserve water rights. So when you go deal with these folks, they're not your trustee. Be ready for a battle. Matter of fact, what they'll do is try to negotiate waivers, <coughs> which is a big thing now. Why the hell should we waive anything? Because they're in control. And Hillary Thompson, I talked to her personally, the five of us of the four chairs that are here, sat in the room with her less than a year ago and said, what the hell are you, I, I, I basically said, you know, knock off the bullshit. Here's what you're trying to do. You're trying to take our settlement and it has to be interpreted to fit in to your policy of quantification. She said, yes. That's out of her mouth. The head solicitor of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Interior Department. So that's what they're fighting against. Like Billy said earlier, where the hell do we go? <laughs> Good question. Now some of the things, times are changing, obviously. But I, I kind of like the old 70s. I was first on council in 71. But those days, we used to raise a lot of hell. We didn't ask for stuff. We went and demanded or would raise hell and got away. If we did that stuff today, it would probably be terrorist. <laughs> it was a whole terror bombs. <laughs> so we can't do that too much. But you don't have a trustee, and, and I think everybody needs to really realize that. And if you're going into the interior thinking your trustee's going to help you, they're not. Their whole goal and their stated purpose is, because of Cobell, there's no question about it, is to put the federal government in a position where they have the least liability and exposure to losses. That's the policy of the trustee, not being a true trustee. That's the policy. That's what we're all going to fight against. You know, when it's not down the road two or three generations, it's now. That's happening now. So how, how do we deal with this stuff? You have to dig your feet in and maybe it goes on for some more years. <coughs> more years of fighting. I don't know. But I believe that 100%. As I said to the young man from South Dakota, some of these young guys, you're only as sovereign as you act. You've got to act it. You've got to keep your respect. I'm a sovereign government. I'm going to act that way. Don't give in to these guys just because they're in the higher parts of the government. Uh, we've done everything. Uh, we've even hired the uh, 41st Solicitor General of the United States, Seth Waxman. Read our settlement agreement. Maybe we're wrong. Read it. You know, interpret it for us. We were scared because maybe we were looking at it the wrong way. He read it and said, no, the government's totally wrong. And one thing we, we stress is the <laughs> upper stream rights, right by priority, priority rights. That doesn't mean nothing to your country. Winner's doctrine, so what? Like it doesn't exist. But I think you'll have to realize what you're faced with. We went and we came up, times are changing, so what do we do? We developed that little video that some of you have seen the other night.
trying to educate folks. Uh, in our case, I don't care if Republican or Democrat. In our case right now, the people that are moving to Ford to try to help us are all Republicans. A couple of Democrats are our main folks. In California, I am Feinstein and Bob Boxer. What do you talk about? Because the federal government, and here's what they're doing, and this is to me the main thing as hell. I'm not an attorney in law business, but the staff, the staff of BIA, the Department of Justice, are going around lobbying their position to all of these folks, Feinstein and Bob Boxer, the various government senators. They're lobbying out there. I, I asked our legal folk, do you expect that's got to be illegal? But I guess it's right on the border. Somebody may have asked them a question so they can go talk to them. But you have our <coughs> trustees literally lobbying against us. So I mean, that's some of the stuff that you folks are going to be facing when you talk about trust responsibilities. Yes, not there. And like I, I keep going back to what Billy said, where the hell do we go? We just keep fighting. But that's where they're trying to box us in. So we're working on a new bill now, just basically it's 24 lines long, saying that the federal government will, the, the Secretary of the Interior and the Department of Justice will sign off on a bill that was approved and signed by President Reagan in 1988. And we're unique because one, we're not a stream adjudication case. We didn't adjudicate the water. We agreed how we're going to manage it. Ours is more of a stream management type agreement. So we all agree on that. And, I, and that's what Seth Waxman, the Solicitor General of the United States, said. Where do you have an agreement where all the disputing parties that were suing each other all agree and they're all on the same side? And now you've got the federal government. That's the problem. That's what we're dealing with. And we're going to see more of that. You know, maybe, and I think it's a good idea. I don't want people to think about it. But we go sit in the old interior office of Washington, D.C. and start getting some attention. That we got a problem. I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe we do that again to get some attention. We're too passive. And I think we rely too much on our attorneys and lobbyists to take the lead. That's why a lot of our folks, like say, 71 when I first got up council, we do trends throughout the whole United States. People knew each other, knew their problems. But I think a lot of that was because of the Indian boarding schools. <coughs> All of our leaders before us went to school together. They knew each other. We've got to get that back. And what Dick does here, this is a little gathering, but you keep doing this. You start getting people together to share their story, meet each other. So now like we've done. That's what we've got to do. You've got to get that back. We disconnected. We got to get reconnected. Because anything that affects any one of us is going to affect the rest of us. These Supreme Court decisions, these water decisions, it's going to have an impact on all of us. Bay Mills, I think everybody's scared to death what that's going to happen with that. That's major for all of us. Thank you. Let me turn over to Vice Chair Peck from Ohio. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Dick for inviting us, and um, yeah, I'm humbled to be sitting here with so many tribal leaders that uh, have the experience. You don't have the age on me, but you have the experience on me. And uh, I, I appreciate it uh, for being here. Uh, it's hard to talk when you have your peers in the room because I can't uh, tell you any lies uh, or make it up, as Bo always says. But some of the things that Bo um, mentioned, he stole, he stole my thunder. Um, I sat here, I wrote my talk last night, and when I got here this morning after listening to some of the speakers, I rewrote it again and for on my points. So now I'm down to my fourth draft. And I think that one of the things that, that really struck me this morning was when um, Billy Frank said, who do we tell? I think that really struck me because that's, that's where I'm at. Who do we tell? Because we've been, I never do anything about water. 
nothing, absolutely zilch, until I got involved with the San Luis Rey Water Board. My tribe put me on. That was 11 years ago. Now I'm tribal chair. I've been, I'm going on my fifth year. And I think probably the leaders in this room from San Luis Rey, from Victoria Diaz, the vice chairman from San Pasqual, Robert Smith from Paula, Bo Mazzetti, and myself, we could probably teach a class on water. I think we probably have a master's degree in water. But I think what strikes me is that, going back to who do we tell, we've told everybody. We have told everybody, including all of the people on the Hill. Two years ago when NCAI was in Sacramento, we, or a year ago, I can't remember how long Kevin Washburn's been in office, we, we got in to meet him. I think it was his eighth day. There is myself, Chairman Mazzetti, Chairman Smith, who wanted to talk about San Luis Rey. Sat down with him, <coughs> chatted a little bit, asked him, what does it take to get an appointment with the Secretary of the Interior? He looked at us and he said, well, if it makes your ego feel better, then you know that's, that's about what it's gonna take. If, it, if it's only that your ego that you're trying to please, and I thought, you know, it takes me a while to grasp things. About two hours later, I got really mad. <laughs> you know, I said, what, how dare him talk to us like that, tribal leaders? When this is something that is very true to our hearts that we've been dealing with for so many generations. Uh, my son, I'm glad to see the Franks here because nepotism is a well alive in Indian country. My son is tribal secretary for our reservation. <laughs> And he's a third generation um, dealing with San Luis Rey. And I'm thinking, how many more generations do we, do we have to go in order to um, get this settlement done? And I think I was uh, at a meeting in Montana probably two summers ago. And Montana was there. They had signed their four tribes. And everybody was kumbaya in there. They, they, and I'm going to just tell the real story here. So, because it's all the truth. They were just applauding the interior for all their hard work of what they did, you know, how the settlement was done. But they, the difference between our settlement and everybody else's settlement is that Chairman Mazzetti, as Chairman Mazzetti said, we have the legislation, we have the bill, we have the water, and we have the money. Where the other tribes that are settling now, they don't have all of that. All we need is the federal government to sign off on it. To get four tribes together, almost impossible. We did that. To get two local entities, a municipality, and Vista Irrigation to agree with all five bands is a miracle. All seven of us are together now. As he mentioned, in 2004 is when it all started getting in disarray and dismantled. And from that, the federal government totally changed. And I'm sure some of you have heard these names, Hillary Tompkins, Bob Laylaw, Lady Beeland. I'm sure those are names that resonate with a lot of your tribes in dealing with water. Very challenging to work with the Bureau. We, we have done all those things, as Bo said. We hired the attorneys. We've gone the congressional path. We've gone to the interior. We've gone to negotiations with the interior, and now we've hired another law firm. And what I saw about two and a half years ago, because I was a newbie, and even though I was the alternate on the San Luis Rey Water Board, now that I was chair, we would go to these annual meetings for I don't know how many years, and things weren't changing. Just as Mr. George said yesterday, he's sitting at this meeting today, and the Indian issues are not changing. What is wrong? And I'm gonna blame tribal leaders. I think we, we as tribal leaders need to come back to the table and we need to get that, that um in us again to fight. You know, we sit around and we talk about what we mean and how bad the federal government is, but at the same time, we have to change those laws and regulations. We have to fight for our money. I'm having the time of my life as tribal chairwoman. Because I believe in what we're doing, I believe that we need to go to Washington. I think, I've said for years, we need to get an apartment there, and we all need to share in that cost, and somebody needs to be in Washington every single day to be 
fighting for our issues. We had a budget meeting in California last week with the Bureau, talking to us of getting ready to do the, the budget in D.C. in March. And we talked about law enforcement and what our priorities are. And we talked about law enforcement dollars. Oh, no, we don't get law enforcement dollars because it's not in the budget. How many times have we heard that our dollars are discretionary dollars? I think they're too afraid to put us in our own little box because they'll see how minimal the amount of dollars that tribes really get. We aren't fighting for those discretionary dollars as tribal leaders. I think we need to start fighting for what is due to us rather than come to meetings like this and say all of the things that are wrong, we need to stand up and start fighting again like some of the past leaders have done. And I, I applaud Mr. Shepard that recognizes that the past administration is gone and now he's coming and he wants to carry it and find out what he can do for his tribe to make it a better day. The, the attorney firm that we hired, it's, it's kind of comical, um, on that, in that firm is Secretary Salazar, who for some reason, we were never able to get a meeting with. For some reason, he never heard about San Luis Rey. And I don't know how, because we were meeting with his staff, the people that he had hired, why had it never reached his level? We went to NCAI, we got a resolution. We had a resolution from Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association. We have done everything possible with the exception of meeting with the president. And once again, who do we tell? Who do we tell in order to get this resolved? So we hired another attorney firm, and uh, Wilmer Hale. And now we're hoping that with, with this firm, because of Seth Waxman, Solicitor General with the Clinton administration, Secretary Salazar, who is giving advice, and really can't, you know, because of the rules and the laws, there's only certain things that he is able to do. And he feels bad that it never reached his level, or, you know, he said he would have signed off on it. But once again, who do we tell? I do think that a lot of these issues that it was mentioned yesterday in Idaho, that I think tribes need to hone in on specific issues, and we need to start meeting together, because we're hearing the same words from the Department of the Interior. I think all of the tribes that are dealing with water issues need to get in a room, we, someone needs to hold a conference, but we need to start talking about what we can do to change policy, because what the president is saying and what his staffers are saying are two different things. They are not fulfilling what President Obama has continued to tell Indian country. One thing that, that um, I think Bo and I almost forgot to mention was that the current administration or the staff, they have reinterpreted the act. We had Congressman Packer who, wrote, Packer who wrote the legislation. They they told him to his face that that's not what he meant. Patricia Zell, who sat on the Senate Oversight Committee during that time, they ignored what she had to say. People that were there, people that told the story, they are not listening to a word that they're saying, even though they were there and they knew what was being written and what was passed. So one thing I think that, um, that I would like to say is that we all have an attorney's, my tribe is the only tribe out of the five that doesn't have a casino, doesn't have gaming. Uh, we're between opportunities right now. I don't want to say that we're, that we're poor. We have a lot of things going on in, on our reservation. We're doing a lot of different things. But I do think that it's time that Indians show their face again, that we see too many attorneys in the forefront and they're doing the talking for us. It's time that we go and talk to them. It's time that we push them aside and let them know that we're in charge here. We're paying the money. We're the ones that have the voice. We're the ones where the decisions are going to impact our tribe and our tribal citizens. So I would encourage all you new leaders out there, when they tell you it's not the right time, you gotta wait for this meeting to happen, or you gotta wait till these attorneys make that decision, 
or you need to wait until maybe next year when, when the legislator and this person is going to be in office. Don't listen. You need to stand up now and fight for your tribe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bo and Levon. Uh, you know, I think uh, a couple of things. I mean, one, if uh, that draft program I put together really did take some of the things I had was thinking and from past experiences, and obviously the internet, you see this stuff happening. So I just kind of loaded stuff in and tried to you know, make sense of you know addressing a lot of areas if that's what people want. It's just a draft document. It may never happen, but whatever. I mean, I. Be kind of retired a little bit, like on that couch with remote control. <laughs> I guess need to get off the couch. But I think what Levon is saying also is if in the past, and if it's always been that way, maybe always will be, what the tribes tend to isolate themselves and take on the world, so to speak. Uh, it, it's, it's just tough. And the point being is I think that there's more collaboration. It's not different resources, different sides of the reservation, whatever, that's all. But the principles that guide uh, interior justice mm -hmm. will be the same for everybody. But it's like putting them on notice that uh, you can't say one thing to one tribe and something else to another tribe on the same resource, the same issue. <coughs> I think that's what's been happening to some extent. And I'm not saying everything's bad, but I mean it's just that it, it's just unfortunate. You've got to change that. It's really up to the tribal leaders, uh, you know. And so. But I, but I think with the uh, uh, you know, note in that little program, I got everybody in here from San Luis Rey to the Fish Commission to Coeur d'Alene to wherever. I, mean, I, I know your issues are, I know them, but I have a feel for where you're at and your, your plight as far as water resources go. And obviously, the experience of the, the, those who've gone before in terms of a settlement. I think I just recently uh, saw where one of the tribes at least, a short term lease of its rights, some, some water for about 75 million. Uh, you know, and uh, but, but there's a lot to try to monitor. You know, and obviously the you know the, the tribally owned uh, natural resource that's the glue. If you, we lose that, we're going to lose a lot. But you know the pressures for more development, you know, diminishing open space. Uh, you know, it's, it, these forces are building, and uh, uh, you know we're, we're just not always going to necessarily get our way. But I mean, to me, that's the important kind of trying to be together. Uh, and even, you know, some of these conflicts, what X state does, another state does it differently or whatever, and I, you know, I, it's another kind of dimension we have to deal with. Um, but if you would, those who are interested, we kind of view or peruse that draft water program. If you think it's something that should be done, uh, let me know, and maybe we can work something out or work a way to, to make that happen. And I think it's important uh, sooner than later, because even with the political landscape, I mean, how it's changing, you know, and historically, the person, the, the party in power with the president, with the presidency, they lose seats during the midterm elections. You know, those margins are already slim, but they're probably going to be slimmer. And so we're in for some dysfunction of government for a while. And uh, which means how do we, you know, view, how do we make progress with some of our issues? And I think uh, we've got to try to do it uh, collectively in some areas. And I know some groups are really working hard to do that, be it in health or, you know, some of the other areas. So they're just a, a big uh, agenda for Indian country. But uh, certainly if you have some thoughts about that draft program on the water, let me know. And I would appreciate it. And maybe I just go back to the couch, especially since the 49ers didn't make it to the Super Bowl. <laughs> but uh, the people from uh, Hawaii and Alaska have been very patient. And as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, I tried to really look at governance issues and homelands and resources. You know, and uh, as I mentioned uh, when I attended the uh, uh, the subsistence retreat up in Alaska on February the third, I believe it was. Uh, it was very interesting. I mean, they, they got a war on there to really put together their battle plan, you know, to deal with it. And it involved not only the state of Alaska, but, you know, multiple federal agencies, what have you, and it's not a big picture. And even to get their their own congressional delegation to be more uh, honest and specific and, uh, you know, certainly looking at options. I mean, is there, is there 
some way an executive order could be helpful, or a secretarial order, or you know, legislation, or and you know, and the, the litigation they won't know if uh, the Supreme Court grants a review on that case until I would assume you know next month. I think the briefing period ends maybe as we're speaking. I forget the, the, the deadline for the briefs and everything. Both uh, Aurora and uh, John know more about it than I do. Uh, I had uh, Rosita Worrell, who was going to come and speak. She is the chair of the San Francisco who came out with a, an illness. And uh, she's also one of the board members for Sea Alaska. So they had, they had their emergency meeting yesterday, whatever that was about. But uh, Aurora is kind of, I guess, the vice president now of AFN. And uh, so she is here to kind of update us and share with you uh, what they're doing when it comes to uh, subsistence rights. Uh, which I mentioned yesterday, also there's a water dimension in there, a big water dimension, with beds and everything. So at this time, Aurora. Okay, just. okay good morning, everyone. So I'm one of the, I think, newer leaders, and I have a hard time sitting down in meetings all day long. So if any of you have that same problem, I'd like to ask you to just stand up and stretch out for a minute and just re-energize. Um, and while we're standing, have you, go ahead, come on. We don't need to wait. <laughs>
reach that other places have the jurisdiction. So the division, um, just to give you a kind of take a look back and see, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Alaska, uh, the reason that it's divided between the state and federal government is because we have these two legal mandates that just um, don't mesh. In uh, ANILCA, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, um, there was a protection guaranteeing Alaska's rural residents a preferential right to hunt and fish on federal lands for subsistence purposes. And that was enacted and was in place um, for a few years. And then the state of Alaska, or uh, there was a case, the McDowell decision, McDowell v. State, where this, in 89, where the state Supreme Court held that this uh, rural preference is in violation of the Constitution. And so after that, so then they're saying, okay, well, you can't have a rural preference. You know, during that time of, time of peace, relative peace in Alaska, you know, the state was managing lands. Now uh, we have, you know, after that, the Alaska Native leaders um, and leaders, you know, within the legislature tried to bring Alaska law in compliance with the NOCA so that we could have this rural preference. Um, unfortunately, the uh, legislature was not able to pass this constitutional amendment allowing for a rural preference um, for hunting and fishing. So, and they've never, they've not been able to come into compliance. So the government, the federal government, took back management of hunting and fishing on federal lands. So now that's just kind of very broad strokes of you know why we have these two <coughs> different um, governing bodies that are dealing with us all the time. And as you can imagine, especially for those of you who live in, um, or you know, have people who live in rural areas, it's really hard when you're just going out and you say, you know, I'm hungry and I need to stock my freezer for the winter. And you go out and you do what you always do. You go out, you fish, you hunt, and then you have two different outside entities coming in and telling you, no, you cannot today. You know, you have a closure. It's an emergency closure, and you know, sorry you didn't know about it, but I'm going to need to take your net now. And this is something that um, had happened. You know, I think uh, as Billy was talking about, there were uh, you know, many arrests and citations given over the past. Uh, I think it was about two years ago, um, along the Kuskokwim River. So, you know, again in Alaska, everything is so grand, so spread out, and we deal with a lot. Everything is intertwined. And so we have climate change, we have declines in our fisheries because of all of the commission or the commercial fishing, you know, the bycatch. And I think another thing to kind of keep in mind, and I'm sorry, I get a little worked up when I talk about this, so I hope I don't go, you know, all over the place. But um, when we talk about subsistence fishing, you know, the our harvest, the overall harvest of Alaska natives or of subsistence users which tend to be Alaska Natives, is 2%. 2% of all of the harvest of fisheries. That's what we're fighting over. That's what we're trying to protect. So it's it can get a little frustrating, you know? We're saying we're trying to fill our freezers and provide for our families. And you know, meanwhile, there are all of these other interests. Because then you have, you know, we also work in the commercial fisheries. And so we're, you know, kind of on all sides of this. But anyways, um, I think, you know, as Dick mentioned, we did have a retreat recently. Uh, Alaska Federation of Natives, AFN, uh, has brought together Native leaders, you know, people who can make decisions and get things going. And the reason that this retreat needed to happen so soon, um, you know, it kind of alludes to it. There's a proclamation that was just handed out and this is something that was handed, uh, passed at our 2012 convention. Because we recognize that this battle is um, only becoming more and more intense. And we're facing more and more challenges. And it's time that we need to really take action and come together as a community, um, with, which is you know, quite a task in itself to get consensus amongst 
the Alaska Native communities, um, and you know, to find out what we need to do. And then this uh, pending Supreme Court case has just you know pushed that timeline so much faster because what the state is seeking to do is. Um, you know, they're trying to get the Supreme Court to declare that 99% of the waters in Alaska are not protected by the subsistence priority, which would essentially eliminate everything that it, we have even now. Um, so this would be a devastating blow to our subsistence rights, and we don't want the Supreme Court to take it for obvious reasons that you all know. <laughs> um, they're not friendly, uh, we don't, you know, we're kind of putting together the worst case scenarios for if they do take it. But in the meantime, we're saying, okay, they take it, they don't take it, whatever, that's not something that we can take handle right now, but what we can do is come together and see what these other options are. What other ways can we move forward? And um, that's why we had this retreat. And there were four options that really came out of this that we talked about. One of them is revisiting the idea of a state constitutional amendment um, that would allow for, because right now in the Constitution it says that um, natural resources are for all Alaskans, equal access for all Alaskans. And that's what the state Supreme Court said was um, made in the provision for rural preference uh, on the constitutional. So this has been attempted a couple times um, before my time, you know, in. Uh, still in college, so <laughs> I wasn't there, but uh, you know, it's, it was pretty close both times, and the, I'd say one of the main reasons that we're starting to think, you know, this hasn't gone forward is because, um, you know, the representation in the legislature doesn't really reflect the, the wishes of the constituents, really, you know, if you said, if you took a public poll of whether we should amend, we should allow for a subsistence preference. You know, there would be a majority. There would be, I would, I would assume, personally, I would say it would be more than 75%. People say yes, allow for subsistence to preference. But then you go to the legislature and it's a hard fought battle. And it's not one that um, most Native leaders, or the, <coughs> most of the Native community isn't really willing to take on right now. So another option um, is an executive order mandating co-management. And um, that seems to be an option that um, you know, the Alaska Native community is interested in pursuing. And I'll talk about co-management also in the context of um, legislation. You know, right now we have kind of small pieces of legislation going through to protect very specific issues, subsistence issues. You know, um, there is a bill going to markup in either this week or next week um, in natural, House Natural Resources, allowing for gull lake harvest, traditional gull lake harvest in Huna, um, it's found in Southeast Alaska. And you know, then we have a provision in the sportsman's package that will hopefully be going to the floor soon. Um, that you know, we're we're hearing rumblings that it should go to the floor that will uh, eliminate the need for duck scan so that our um, migratory bird hunters don't need to go and file for permits and such. There will be an exemption for subsistence users for duck stamps. And these steps are great, however, it doesn't necessarily address the bigger picture. You know, the, you know this doesn't eliminate the instances like two years ago where we had all of these fishermen who are arrested and have their equipment confiscated. And it's not just confiscated, they cut nets. You know, and nets aren't cheap. So it, it's, there's some pretty, pretty nasty things happening out there um, that have some very real impact on people. But what we're pushing for now and is really pushing for co-management. Because, you know, in this time of and one of the things that we're reminding our legislators and you know the different agencies about is in this time of financial constraint where everybody's budgets are shrinking, why not look to the tribes as a resource rather than as a drain or a burden? You know, we have the capacity to do this. And if we don't have the capacity now, help us build it up. Because we have other resources. 
services. And we don't need to just be saying, oh, well, you know, you come in and take care of this. Well, we'll take care of it. You know, just let us take care of it. Let us do it. And um, let's